So I'll go ahead and start uh, with safety and quality assurance, um, a review of established uh, guidelines. Oh, a few disclosures. Um, our department does have some, uh, some grants um, both with both industry and publicly funded. Oh, I think it's a good idea, and uh, recall this is all going to be part of a SAM session to make sure that uh, references are out there that have been real important. This was one of the first ones to come out. This is the one that planted the flag saying SBRT should be in radiation oncology and not surgery or some other place. Um, it also defined the duties of what uh, various people in our profession do, including physicists. This was another one, uh, also of importance, and kind of a, a follow-up, a practice guideline. So I recommend this. And uh, this is very important when ASTRO and ACR bank recommendations, that's a big word. So This is one uh, that's come up several times. This is the Task Group 101. This one had a mere 24 authors, four of whom were physicians. It also has lots of recommendations, um, in this case from the American Association of Physicists and Medicine. This is one I'm actually going to show several from. Um, this is a, a came out in Practical Radiation Oncology, the Pro Journal, on quality and safety considerations in stereotactic radiosurgery and SBRT. And the, I want to remind everyone that there's an executive summary to this that has supplemental material. It actually has um, sample checklists, and these checklists are real handy. Um, we specifically uh, included that so that. People could borrow them, use them. Um, you don't need to write your own. You know, the idea is that maybe you could modify some of these. Um, our Canadian friends have also come up with some uh, very instructive uh, guidelines. So this is the Canadian Associ Association of Radiation Oncology Scope of Practice Guidelines for Lung, Liver, and Spine, SBRT. Very nice guide here. There's a second one on uh, Radio Surgery Advisory Committee from, uh, from Canada as well. And then I'm going to just briefly, uh, we were very fortunate to have Christy Brock Leatherman um, do a presentation. She's going to be here today for uh, this discussion group. Um, <clears throat> and so this has become such an important part of our field. We are relying more and more, not just on our treatment planning systems, but basically because we're an image-guided um, practice on doing lots of fusions and co-registrations. It's funny, she kept putting up her hand and I thought she was, and doing fusions, I thought she was gonna do the Michigan thing, you know, where people in Michigan. Are. In any case, so uh, very important, uh, so uh, uh, QA uh, for image registration. That one is not out yet, but um, we're fortunate to have her here to uh, ask her some questions and get some advice. This one's not out yet either, um, and we have it sort of as a discussion guideline, so it was kind of, but um, uh, Sonia Dietrich's gonna be heading up this little area, so she'll be able to answer a lot of your questions on small field dosimetry. A big field for us is small field dosimetry. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Joyner here, who's a member of this working group on SBRT, to talk about some of the radiobiological effects of hypofractionation. This one I'm going to uh, go over some of the authors on. I think there's like 75 or so. Um, but this is uh, something in process. I call it Quantec 2. That's not what it's going to be called. Or I call it sometimes Quantec SBRT. Um, but I don't think it's going to be called that either, but basically that's what it is, is looking at uh, normal toxicities and tumor control uh, probabilities with hypofractionation. Very important that when that comes out. So yeah, none of those are published yet. So uh, I think I'll just kind of throw out, this one's been out for a while, since 2010. I think I'll just throw out one little uh, issue that's uh, associated with this, and people have brought this up to me a few times. I never expected these tables on normal tissue tolerances that we published in TG101 to be valid for a prolonged period of time. I was just doing my best to get out the latest version of it. And so obviously there have been a lot of caveats and we expect to have some changes. Um, in particular, um, there is sparse long-term follow-up for SBRT, that data should be treated as a first approximation, and doses are mostly invalidated, and they are based mostly on observation and theory. And so there is some measure of, obviously, educated guessing going on. So um, just keep that in mind, and please bring up your questions to uh, Dr. Joyner on that. 
So this is um, the uh, AAPM working group on SBRT, and as you can see, there's 74 physicians, physicists, and radiobiologists. So um, this is going to take quite a while to get that many people to agree on a lot of things. But I think it's going to be very, very important. I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to see a focused edition on this, hopefully within two years, but maybe within one year. Okay, so this is an important one. <clears throat> um, I'm uh, really happy of being, to have been part of this. Actually, this was headed up by my friend Tim Solberg, who's now in uh, Pennsylvania. And this is quality insurance and uh, safety in SR SRS and SBRT. And this has lots of neat tables in it um, that I think are important for anyone who wants to start a stereotactic program. So for example, this one, table one, essential planning aspects for developing a new SBRT program and or considering new disease sites. So there's several different things in there, lots of different references. I'm just gonna point to this one right here that I'm a real big fan on, and that is <clears throat> developing and using checklists for all aspects of SRS and SBRT processes. Now, you know, this whole idea of checklist doesn't mean you're waving around a piece of paper all the time. It, uh, I mean, a lot of our checklists are actually digital checklists. We've got them that can populate in our um, uh, electronic uh, record systems, et cetera. So, but the idea of having a checklist, make sure that we are as complete and as comprehensive in our program as possible. Anyway, great table to c consider. This is another one that I think is real important. Um, we had vendors here, um, et cetera. So this is personnel qualifications of a stereotactic program. And this is real key um, because a lot of people ask me, um, well, when they're buying, or some people tell me, well, the, the administrator purchased this equipment and didn't purchase any training. And I thought, well, you need to get the training. Um, you know, and, and actually, I'd like to talk with the vendors and say, hey, you need to include training. It should be in one of those options that just says included. But basically, uh, we all came out on a limb here and said all personnel must receive vendor-provided equipment-specific training prior to involvement in an SBRT program, 16 hours per staff member. So the idea is that you're not supposed to just receive some equipment, get some equipment, and not have any training on it. So two days, whether that's on-site, go to Las Vegas, whatever it is, um, we're expecting that you're gonna have some training included within any major purchase you're gonna be using for SBRT. Commissioning. Well, this is a key thing, and some of you might be going back to your um, clinics and saying, you know, and, and you need to have, be armed with some data to tell your physician that, hey, you know, we can't just start the program next Monday. We, there's a lot of work we have to do. And so if you look at this list, uh, you know, you need appropriate resources, specialized equipment, personnel time must be evaluated, independent assessment of measured uh, beam time, et cetera. You look at these durations, you got on the right here, um, eight to 16 weeks for some of these, one week, four to eight weeks for um, the treatment planning commissioning, uh, independent verification. Um, we spoke a lot about that, sending uh, some of your, uh, sending phantoms back to either the, our, uh, I, IROC or the private version of IROC, et cetera. So the idea is that this is a, a weeks long operation. This is not something you say, oh, let's do it tomorrow or let's do it next week or let's do it in a couple weeks. And you can point to this table. Moreover, you wanna make sure that we prevent any catastrophic um, failures. And uh, some, I'm actually gonna go over a few of those because again, I think they're very instructive. So recommendations to guard against catastrophic failures. And this is where you wanna assemble your team. This is where you wanna have a team. So someone in the team is primarily responsible for something and then there's secondary and tertiary, et cetera. So under principle, we've gotten several of these categories. Physicist is the principal um, team player, but never all by themselves. Um, so looking at machine output, um, treatment planning system, uh, patient uh, selection should be in accordance with an approved clinical protocol. That's uh, more going to be more of the physician, etc. So these are all worked out on who's going to be the principal. But again, it's never just on one person's shoulders. So it, then it switches over. Um, uh, primary re review. So you may have a second physicist that would be looking over. You, have, you know, you want to have your physician and your dosimetrist, the therapist, everybody involved. Everyone knows what's going on. So we have principal, primary review, secondary review, everyone is part of the, there's no surprises. 
Oh, so again, um, this particular uh, um, uh, report, the executive summary, only the online version, which at this point just about everyone's going to be the only version people would get, has um, it's uh, got to be at least a dozen checklists on there for spine, for lung, um, etc. And I strongly recommend taking a look at these. Um, you're going to need to modify them. Nobody, no two programs are alike. That's important. Um, <clears throat> but there they are. This is an SBRT uh, lung work list. Um, they came from a lot of different sites. We removed the institutions from, uh, from the name, but they basically came from Timmerman's group uh, in uh, at Texas. They came from Colorado. They came from Virginia. They came from, I think they, some came from Michigan. So <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of them. This is another document that I think is an important one, um, available free from Astro. And uh, it's a 52-page document that represents an intensive collaboration among 31 specialists, um, which is physicians, physicists, excuse me, dosimetrists, nurses, etc. You can download this as a PDF from the Astro website. <coughs> and the key thing that it has in there, now some people don't agree with this, but you need to have some data point to start with, is what is the proper staffing if you're going to have a stereotactic program. If you start doing stereotactic, that's a new program incrementally that you've now taken on more responsibility. So this does address that. Um, and in fact, there's a section here for SBRT and the relative uh, FTE factor, both for physicists and dosimetrists, if you're going to have such a program. So keep that in mind when trying to determine if you have enough staff to even start this program. Okay, so um, in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to kind of go over some errors and things that have happened. So uh, back in March 2013, French doctors and a radiologist, or, which basically was a physicist, were jailed for radiation overdoses. Um, two doctors and a radiologist have been sentenced to 18 months in prison for their role in radiation overdoses that killed at least 12 people in France and left dozens seriously ill. One of the major parts and problems with this was that there was a lot of cover-up involved. But um, the point is that things happen, there are responsibilities, and we need to make sure that we can do the very best we can to uh, operate the safest as we possibly can. So yeah, this was uh, linked to a calibration error. All this was linked basically to a calibration error. Um, in introducing new machines. Any time you have a new machine, you're going to want to cross uh, calibrate it and get other data and make sure that your machine is not an outlier. And if your machine is an outlier, there's a problem because nobody has real outliers out here. Well, unless it's, you knowingly did something. <clears throat> So um, some of these slides are from Ryan Foster, um, a great guy who's down in Texas. And uh, he's, he and I have put together several uh, presentations on uh, learning lessons from uh, uh, very basic uh, stereotactic accidents. And uh, so I've got a couple of his slides. He's got a few of mine. Let's just talk about this one. Um, improper jaw size during um, stereotactic radio surgery. This was when the physicist told the therapist to please set a 40 by 40. Well, he meant 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters. Or excuse me, yeah, 40 millimeters. And she thought it was 40 centimeters by centimeters. And so, of course, the field size was way too big. And so normal tissue received uh, more dose than the target. And uh, this led to major complications and then death. So. This happened again. So it happened in France, then it happened again here. We're not learning. We need to do a better job. 2009, same sort of situation applied. Collimator jaws for the stereotactic treatment were left open during the treatment. So this patient actually did pass away as well. So the idea is that the same thing happened. And so we obviously need to learn from these uh, consequences. Um, another situation where the cone, so you have the insert, and then the cone goes inside that, was left out. A technician failed to insert a conical uh, uh, collimator prior to stereotactic radiosurgery, which resulted in a dose being delivered to a patient that varied greater than 10 percent, a lot more than 10 percent, and that's, but that was actually their cutoff criteria. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit, and this is important uh, for those of you who want to go into the discussion group with uh, Dr. Diederich. Large chambers used to make small field stereotactic measurements of output factors. 2007 in France. Um, I'm not picking on France. They, they're just very good in revealing um, things, and that's really what we want. We want basically everyone to, to let us know, uh, you know what's, what's going on. But in this instance, they had up to 200% overdose for some of their patients. And so the idea and the lesson other than that is to compare your commissioning values with other institutions and look for guidance. Key thing is this happened again. It happened in Missouri. So um, they basically overdosed at, uh, by about 50% um, when an unidentified medical physicist at the hospital miscalibrated the new equipment and routine checks over the next five years failed to catch the error and the error was discovered in 2009. So this was very unfortunate. Uh, I'm not gonna go into great detail here, um, and please uh, feel free to talk to Dr. Diederich about this, but as you get to small, and I believe this was also discussed in the lectures yesterday, um, if you get to smaller and smaller field sizes, um, as Indra and Chetty showed, you basically are gonna start to have um, uh, inadequate uh, detector size to source size, um, and you're gonna basically get an underdose, which means you will lead to an overdose of a patient. So again, yeah, we, we learn from uh, other uh, situations. By the way, I don't think I have, a, have it discussed here, but Astro does have something called Royals. They've spent a lot of money on it. Um, AAPM also spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this. This is the Radiation Oncology Incident Learning System. It's free to participate in this. And it's also free to see what kind of things are coming up over the course of the year. Basically, what you do is you participate in any kind of incident that happens or near miss. Near misses are, are the most instructive. You can review those and see what, what's going on in the country. And that's, that's how we're going to learn. Miscalibration, yes. So 77 patients in Moffitt get excess radiation. Um, again, for the smaller, oh, this was a miscalibration, yes. So received a 50% overdose, and the idea, again, is get that second check. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, yes, uh, this has uh, been dis uh, discussed. This is going to become a, a bigger and bigger deal with Indra Das's um, TG-155 when it comes out. Um, but in the meantime, there are other documents. Um, IPEM has a document on small field dosimetry. And you can talk with Dr. Diederich about that. In general, though, from the Task Group 101, SBRT often uses small fields and beamlets, of course. And this can cause a variety of dosimetric effects. Um, loss of lateral uh, e electronic equilibrium was a, bit, a key one. Volume averaging uh, is, a, is an issue. So if your detector size is uh, big and you've got this gradient across it. Detector inter interface artifacts up against two different ma materials. Collimator effects, uh, detector positioning and orientation effects. So use detectors with a spatial resolution of one millimeter or better for basic dosimetry measurements. That was sort of a rule of thumb. Be very careful with setup and detector positioning. Remember that uh, MLC shapes have more uncertainty than circular cones. Circular cones don't change. They're circular cones. <clears throat> They're not as popular anymore, but they were pretty easy to, uh, to get the physics down. And so when detector de diameter is close to the field width, half maximum of the field, the detector volume effect becomes very significant. And in fact, for that, there is a recommendation, because several people asked me about this, so I wanted to include it in the slides. The maximum inner diameter of a detector should be less than half the full width half maximum of the smallest beam measured in order for the deconvolution of the detector size effect to work properly. So that's a good one to kind of keep in mind, and you can discuss that in the discussion groups. You want to do end-to-end, -end, you want to make sure everything's done correctly. <coughs> so um, beam data acquisition is challenging, it's time consuming, but do it right. Dealing with small fields is an issue. Um, you have sharp gradients. So key thing is to get all this right. 
And how do you know if your data is good? You want to compare it with other institutions and other machines. That's a key uh, aspect. A lot of that data is out there. Sample data is out there. Goldbeam data is out there. Colleagues' data is out there, et cetera. I've helped a lot of people identify extra data for them to compare to. So um, obviously, it's, we're not just always looking at um, <clears throat> Those sort of issues, we've got a, a variety of other. What about localization accuracy, um, IGRT accuracy? These, uh, you must perform end to end tests. And you need to do that at least once a year, certainly upon the commissioning, and at least once a year. So, recommends the TG101 recommends end to end localization accuracy at the initial commissioning and annually thereafter to make sure you haven't kind of lost your way during the course of the year. And then this is back when it was RPC. But basically, the whole idea is that you can send your data off and have a secondary um, uh, review. Now, the independent organization, just it's between you and that independent organization. If you do it with the RPC and I IROC, they manage to, they keep those records and they can become, uh, they're more accessible uh, on a broad scale. So let's start with a question. So the use of procedural checklists can be particularly effective at ensuring compliance and minimizing error. I'm a big fan of checklists. Which of the following best describes the use of checklists for treatments? Checklists are only helpful for the initial stages of an SBRT program. The adoption of the same site specific checklists from other institutions will usually suffice for initiating SBRT. C, checklists are exclusively for the therapist to review and ensure that the patient has been set up correctly. D, checklists used prior to daily treatment must be customized to the particular treatment planning and delivery system. Rats, I was hoping for 100%. <coughs> So uh, in any case, uh, yes, so you'd want to uh, um, customize your checklists um, prior to using it. And uh, so cause the checklist that they have at University of Texas Southwestern, even if it, they have really the same equipment compared to where you are in Ohio or wherever else, there's going to be some customization that's going to be needed um, <clears throat> because everyone's program and everyone's flow is slightly different. Okay, so uh, yeah, and that's the Solberg uh, uh, reference from 2011. Question two. So when target and or critical structures cannot be localized accurately due to motion or metal artifacts, which of the following applies? So you can't localize it very well. Do you utilize the deformation image registration features of the treatment planning system to develop a treatment plan? B, do you contour the target and critical structures as best you can and increase the margins on the target to a level that is necessary to account for the motion? C, do you reduce the dose? Reduce the dose and or fractionation from the standard protocol to account for the errors in localization. D, use orthogonal films, orthogonal AP and lateral KV planar imaging to develop a 2D plan for treatment and setup. Or E, do not pursue SBRT as a treatment option. Well, interesting. <clears throat> um, so, no, we don't want to contour the target just as best we can. Basically, if you can't see what you're trying to treat in SBRT, you shouldn't be treating it. And so I was worried that some people would say, well, just use the deformation registration thing. And so Christie's going to make a lot of exceptions on that. Deformation registration is not a key one. A lot of people didn't pick that. But no, don't just contour um, critical structures as best you can and increase the margins because we're not supposed to be doing, if we don't have very good visualization of our target, we don't just increase margins. SBRT is not an option. Excuse me. Well, that does it. Thank you very much.